All right, tonight we've got uh, we've got to we've got to answer the question. We've got to put aside the hype. There's a couple of critical questions that I need clarity on tonight. I need them to be answered. And, and first and foremost, and I'm going to need you to raise your hand to different points to to help me get clarity in terms of the answer to these critical questions. The first question I've got for you, it's it's this: which is better, Pepsi or Coke? All right, ready? So, in favour of Pepsi, raise your hand. Couple, Coke. All right, Coke it is. Uh, Next question, NCIS or CSI? All right, NCIS? CSI? NCIS, I reckon. Be very careful with this one. Apple or Microsoft? Ready? Apple? Microsoft? I'll pray for you. (laughs) Right, Star Wars or Star Trek? Okay, Star Wars? Star Trek, I'll keep praying for you. All right. And now, now the ultimate question, the ultimate question, DC or Marvel, okay? All right, All right? Um, DC, Marvel, Marvel has it. See, I reckon there are some things in life that are actually about preference, Correct. We can have preference about certain things. In fact, you ever met somebody when there's a, there's a question about preference, but they actually argue as if it's not preference. They're actually really, really irritating, like a zealot for their cause. You know, they, they, they could never entertain a world where it wasn't all about Star Trek or it wasn't all about CSI or, or whatever. You know, they, 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 like for them, there's only one answer to that question. They can't entertain that people can have differences about these sorts of things, that people can have preferences about these sorts of things. But but some things in life have preference. You can just either prefer this or you prefer this, correct? Now the question is, is faith one of them? Is faith just merely a matter of preference? Can we just say, I prefer this faith or this religion over this faith or this religion? I think it's okay in our, our world, if you talk to most people, okay, so the people will say, I'm on a spiritual search, or I'm spiritual, or they can even say, I have a personal faith, or personal belief. That, that seems to be okay. But what we had read for us a moment ago, the thing that Jesus said, is one of the most offensive, provocative things to so many people in our culture, in our world today. Jesus said these, these words, I am the way, and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I mean, it it sort of sounds like an arrogant thing to say, doesn't it? That that Jesus is the only way. How can you actually say that, that he's the only way? When we look at the marketplace today, when we look at our our world today, we we live in multicultural Australia today, and we actually see so many faiths, so many different beliefs, so many different ideologies. How can we claim that Christianity is the only way? I mean, what about those people who never heard about Christianity? What about those people who live a good moral life? It seems like this claim of Jesus to say that he is the only way offends just about everybody. I mean, if you're a good Jew, you would say, understanding the the Jewish laws and obeying them, that's the way. So it offends them. And many other faiths, you have different prophets who, who say, no, it's this path or this discipline or this behavior or this ritual. And they're all saying that's sort of the way. And so when Jesus says he is the way or the only way, it's offensive to them. In fact, we live in, in a culture that is what we call pluralistic. It's the idea that people can have many different faiths or our culture can have inhabit many different faiths and stuff. And it's okay for them to coexist. And so for anyone to say that my faith is the ultimate faith, it's offensive. And yet, Jesus claimed he is the only way. And when he says that, it's awkward then, and I think it's awkward now. And in fact, if you go into a cafe or a workplace or or encountered a private conversation about faith, I think... The word on the street about religion is this, and certainly in Australia, I suspect they said, hey, uh, we've got all these different faiths, and all these faiths basically teach the same thing. 
And so how can anybody say there are there anybody how can anybody claim that their faith is the way or the only way? Or how can anybody claim that their faith is exclusive when don't they all just teach the same things? Whether it's Yahweh, the God of the Bible, whether it's Allah or Buddha, the idea is that essentially these beliefs all basically teach the same things. You can't claim that you've got the right way. I understand that sentiment. I don't need to be right. I don't need to prove everybody else wrong to be validated. I understand the sentiment that that you actually want. I love for everybody to be right and everybody to be okay. But the interesting thing is when you look at all the different faiths in our culture, they to say they're all the same, it, it it's actually not true. If we pay close attention to what they believe, they, they actually believe very, very different sorts of things. For example, the, the Hindus, they believe in there are, there are many gods and they each god re- reflects some uh, aspect of reality, but they're, 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 each god is real in itself. And, and that's sort of a Hindu belief. And then you get a, the, a guy that was a Hindu that started the Sikh faith and he says, no, 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 there's not many gods, there's actually only one God, and then the, then out of that comes, or out of the same sort of region come, comes this sort of Buddhist faith, and it says, well, actually, we don't know that there's any one God, or there are, in fact, that there are any gods. We actually think there are no gods. And so, what is it? Is it they're like, are there many gods? Is there one God, or there are no gods? They actually don't believe the same things. And so, what about Jesus? What do they think about Jesus? Well, if, if, if you come to a Christian worldview, that Christians would say, would say Jesus is the Son of God. He is the Messiah. He came to save us. He, he, he lived, he died on a cross, and he rose again. But if you ask a Jew who's Jesus, a, a Jew might say, no, 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 no. Jesus sort of, he claimed to be the Messiah, but he wasn't actually the Messiah. It's just any, one of any number of pretenders who claimed to be the Messiah. But then if you ask a Muslim, a Muslim would say, well, uh, he's sort of a prophet. But we don't actually think he died on a cross. He certainly didn't rise again. He's certainly not the son of God. Or if you ask different faiths about the afterlife, what do we believe about what happens beyond? Where, where's the, where does this all end? Where are we all going with this? Well, a Hindu might say, hey, you have a soul and it gets reincarnated over and over again until you, you find yourself in a worthy state to, to go into this non-physical reality where you should become one with everything. And the classic, classic Buddhism, there, there are all sorts of different branches and variations of Buddhism, but classic Buddhism would say, no, actually, you have no soul. There's no goal in that you just sort of return to non-existence, to, to nothingness. And then Christianity says, no, no, actually, uh, it, it's not just your soul that will exist forever, that you'll have a bodily resurrection and that you will live forever with God. And so the, the notions of the afterlife, they can't even agree. So when you look at all the different religions, they, they can't actually agree. And so the God who wrote the Bible, can he really have been the same God of the, that wrote the Koran, the Islamic Koran, or the, or the Buddhist Tripitaka, or the Hindu Upanishads? Can, can it really be the same God, the same belief, sort of hidden through them all? And I actually think to say that they all believe the same, that, that, all, that all beliefs are effectively the same or all believe the same things, all arrive at the same destination, it actually devalues human choice. Uh, every human being, we, we, have, we, have, we have significance and value and people make choices about what they believe and they actually, whether we like it or not, people believe different things. They make different choices. They're attracted to different things. Imagine if I was going to a, a shoe shop. And imagine, say, if I went to a shoe shop one day and, and say, uh, Liam and I went to a shoe shop with me and, and Jen came to a shoe shop with me and the three of us walk in. And, and we've done research. We, we actually know what sort of shoe that we want. And so we go through the range of shoes they've got and, and we actually find the shoes that we like and, and we, we try them on, we size them up and then we get the shop assistant and we say, hey, we've chosen the shoes that we've liked. You know, we've looked through your range, we've tried a couple on, we've we figured the right size, we need certain sizes and different designs. And so Liam orders the shoes that he likes, and Jen orders the shoes that she likes, and I order the shoes that I like. And what if the shop assistant then came back to us and they gave us a box each, and then we opened the boxes and we all had exactly the same shoe. 
And it was, wasn't actually the shoe that we, we had picked, the one that we'd researched, the one that we'd sized. It just, it, we just all got the same shoe. And we said, it would be a little weird, wouldn't it? It would be like a little frustrating. That we'd be saying, like, what's going on? Why are you, why are you giving us this shoe? It's not the shoe. And, and what if they, the, the shop assistant said to us, hey, here's the real deal. Like, we know that you like the illusion of choice and preference. We know you like all that. But the reality is it's all the same shoe. And it doesn't matter what you like or what your preference was. It just everybody gets the same shoe. We think this is weird. This is frustrating. This is an illusion. This is this is a sleight of hand. And see, when Jesus says he is the only way, it sort of seems narrow if we assume that every other religion is this, they're all the same and that he's claiming he's the same as everybody else. And yet, that's not what he's claiming at all. And see, so this this notion that that we believe that all religions are the same and all end up at the same place and believe the same things and arrive at the same destination uh, is often referred to as common pluralism. And it, it doesn't take much to look at them and go, well, actually, they, they just don't. They just don't. As much as we we'll want them, as much as we we'll want to say, just believe what you want to believe and it'll all be okay, we can't because they don't actually agree on whether it's one God or many gods or no gods or where we go or how we get there. They just, they're just completely and utterly different. And so scholars who wrestle with this, oh, okay, maybe there's another way to find truth. And, and it's sometimes referred to as sophisticated pluralism. And the idea is that actually maybe behind all the different religions, there is one big sort of hidden truth. And that maybe the idea is that, that every religion, from Christianity to Judaism to Islam to Hindu to Buddhism to, to, to being a, a Sikh or Baha'i or, or whatever, the, the idea is that, that they none of them actually have got it. They've all got like bits and pieces. They're all ultimately flawed. And that there is actually one real big truth that is sort of hidden. The ultimate reality is sort of hidden beneath everything else. And so nobody can claim that they've got the ultimate truth. So nobody can say, I am the way. And so the idea is it doesn't matter if you pray to Allah five times a day. It doesn't matter if you follow the Buddhist eightfold path to enlightenment. It doesn't matter if, if, you, uh, if you try to, to mimic uh, Muhammad as best you can with every aspect of your life it, it, and follow every, every, every dot and every stroke in the Quran. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you trust in Jesus. It, it's, it's sophisticated pluralism, just, it doesn't actually really matter. There is, a, there is a grand truth that can't be known. It's sort of hidden behind everything else. And, and so you just, do, you just do your little bit of the truth and that'll help you in some way, but ultimately we, none of us can know it. And there's a really famous sort of Indian parable which tries to, to, uh, to help explain this idea. It's actually it was very well known in India. There's, there's one day, the, the story of this king, and he wanted to teach his court the the truth about life and the, and about truth. And so what he did is he, he actually got an elephant brought into his court. And then he also sent some of his, his men down to the city gates and said, I want you to get three blind beggars and bring them up to my court. And so here he is, he's got, the, he's got people watching around, he's going to teach them this sort of lesson, there's, there's the elephant there, the, the blind beggars come in, they're a little anxious, they're not really sure what's going on, they, they know they've been called before the king, but they're not really sure what's going on. And the king says to him, hey, can you describe to me what the elephant is like? And they're a bit nervous, they say, well, yeah, we're sort of blind, we, we, we actually don't know what the elephant is like. The king said, no, no, I want you to feel it and then describe it. And so. One guy grabs the, the leg of the elephant and goes, oh, an elephant's like a tree trunk. It's big, it's round, it's thick. And I can sort of wrap my arms around it. That's what an elephant's like. And the other one's, the other one's going, no, 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 no. And he's holding the tusk. He's, no, 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 it's like a, it's like a, a plow with the, the, uh, the sheaths on them. You know, I, I, I can feel them. That's what it's done. It's nothing like what you're thinking. It's like this. And then the other one said, no, no, no. And he's holding the tail. He goes, no, it's like a long, slender brush. That's what the elephant is like. 
And the king, having felt that he's made his point, then tells the court that, hey, truth is, this is like truth. Truth, truth is bigger than any one person can know. And the idea is that we are all blind beggars and we can only know part of the truth. And so the person who thinks that truth is founded in the leg only knows part of the truth and and the person that's holding the tail only knows part of the truth and that no one person can know the truth. And it's a way of pointing out, and people who tell this story say it's a way of demonstrating the folly of claiming that anybody can know the ultimate truth and that there's actually a big grand truth that is hidden from us and that all different faiths are just little ways of knowing parts of the grand truth. And it sort of sounds convincing. There was a guy by the name of Leslie Newbigin who was a, uh, a missionary in India. And he heard this story and then he made this observation. He said, The famous story of the blind man and the elephant so often quoted in the interest of religious agnosticism. The real point of the story is constantly overlooked. The story is told from the point of view of the king and his courtiers who are not blind but can see that the blind men are unable to grasp the full reality of the elephant and are only able to get hold of part of the truth. The story is constantly told in order to neutralize the affirmation of the great religions to suggest that they learn humility in recognizing that none of them can have more than one aspect of the truth. But of course, the real point of the story is exactly the opposite. If the king were also blind, there'll be no story. The story is told by the king and is, in, is the immensely arrogant claim of the one who sees the full truth which all, all the religions are only groping for. It embodies the claim to know that the full reality which relativizes all the claims of the religions and philosophies. So I don't know if you get what he's saying, but effectively what he's saying is, hey, the story doesn't work because it assumes that, er, that nobody can actually see. Because the reality is, in this story, there is somebody that actually knows what an elephant looks like. And, is, and how wouldn't it be criminal if the one who can actually see what the elephant is like pretends that to everybody else that they don't know what the elephant is like? Surely the, the, the more humble thing is to say, I know you're struggling around, but I know what the elephant looks like. I can see the elephant. I'm trying to tell you what the elephant is like. And I know you get a sense of what the elephant is like sometimes. I know you have questions about it. And I know you, you, your experience isn't quite the same as everybody else. But I'm telling you, I can see the elephant. I know what the elephant is like. And so he's saying, there is actually somebody that knows the ele- what the elephant looks like. And he can tell us what it's like. And here's the problem with sophisticated pluralism. Who's to say that the grand narrative can't be known. It's actually saying, hey, well, that nobody can actually see or know what the grand story is. Nobody can really know what the elephant looks like. Why? Why is that a self-evident truth? Why, do, why does that have to be so? There's no reason that it has to be so. Now, I understand the attraction of pluralism, the thought that everyone, I don't want to see anybody face judgment But you see, the question of whether there are multiple ways or just one way is not simply an intellectual question, is it? It's an emotional question. Because if people don't find a way, what happens to them? And it raises the question, what's God like? When Jesus says, I'm the only way, does he really care about those who don't find him? What's the character of God like? Does God care more than us or do we care more than God? Does he care about those who don't know life and life to the full with him? Does he just give up on some people? Does he just abandon some people? Is that the point of why he says this? So I think it's really, really interesting about why does Jesus actually say this little phrase that causes so much confusion? Why does he say, I am the way and the truth and the life? Nobody comes to the Father but by me. He's having this conversation with his disciples and they're actually worried because he's told them he's about to go somewhere and he's about to leave and they're wondering, is he going to abandon me? Is he going to leave us? Has he had enough of us? 
The context was this, Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? If I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Jesus says, and do not let your hearts be troubled. Why? Because he's just said to them, well, they, they are worried because he's just said, where you're going, where I'm going, you can't go. And it seems like he's leaving them behind. But what he's actually talking about is, is I'm going to the cross. I'm going to give my life. I'm going to die on your behalf. You can't come. You can't do this one. All they know is they're not, they're not going to be with him. And it troubles them and it concerns them. And they're thinking, is he abandoning us? You know, like Peter, have you just put your foot in your mouth one too many times? Is that, is he like had enough? Is it because we didn't get the parable things? Like I always get confused when he does the parable things, you know? Are they saying like, is it because we didn't get those? Jesus just talked about the fact that, that somebody is going to betray him. Maybe they're thinking, hey, is it because we, after three years, he's realized we're not the right stuff, you know? And he just wants to get rid of us. Is that why he's leaving us? And he just says, do not let your heart be troubled. Because I'm coming back. He's saying, don't be troubled. I'm not abandoning you. I'm going to save you. That's what I'm doing here. He's talking about his life. He's talking about the death on the cross. His substitution for them. So that they can have a life. So that they can have a place. He says, I'm going to go and do this. I need to leave you and do this so that I can actually go and there will be a place for you. And I will prepare a place for you. And I will give you a hope. And I will give you a future. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. Ultimately so that you'll be with me. Ultimately so you'll be with my Father. And he's saying, I just want you to trust me. I want you to trust me that there is no other way, that, 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 that I, I'm doing this for you, I'm, take, I'm preparing a place for you. And he's actually saying, will you trust me that I'm doing this for you? And so when Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me. He's not saying He's not, saying he's not for us. He's not saying he's going to kill us. He's actually trying to speak comfort to those who feel like they're going to get abandoned. To those who feel like they're, 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 perhaps they're not good enough. To those who feel like they're going to be left behind. He's saying, no, no, don't be troubled. I am the way and the truth and life. He's saying, I, I care for you and I've come for you. And when Jesus says, I am the way, he also says, I am the truth. And he also says, I am the life. And you see, faith, faith is not about preference. It's not a Pepsi or Coke question. It's not an NCIS or CSI question. It's not an Apple or Microsoft question. It's a question about life. Who brings life? Who can prepare a place for me? Who can do for me what I can't do for myself? He's not trying to get us to choose his religion. He's trying to alert us to the reality that no one else is coming. No one else is is going to take this journey for you. Nobody else is going to prepare a place for you. Nobody else is coming for you. Nobody else is the way. No one else can give you life. In John 11, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and life. And there's so many other different belief systems in our world today. But they're God or gods. They're not coming for you. In Hindu belief, there's no one coming for you. You just keep cycling through over and over and over again until you get to a point where you maybe you're worthy to become one with everything, maybe. But no one's coming for you. If you're a Muslim, you can work and work and work and work, but Allah's not coming for you. At the best, you can die and you can hope that maybe if Allah wills, you'll be okay. He's not coming for you. See, Jesus, when he says, I'm the way and the truth of life, he's not trying to give us bad news from his perspective. He's trying to give us bad, the bad news from reality. He's saying, there is no one else coming 
There's no one else that can bring you life. There's no one else that can bring you hope. There's no one else that can give you a future, but I am one. He's giving us the bad news from reality. And he's saying no one else is coming. See, this is not a statement. We want to reject it because we think it's a statement about preference. We think it's a statement about what religion do you want. It's not, it's not what Jesus is saying. This is not a question about faith or what religion you prefer. It's a statement about life. As Jesus is saying, guess what? No one else is coming. No other God loves you or pursues you or fully gives you or longs for you. And he's choose, telling us to, cho- to choose him because he chooses us. To a world that wonders if it can know God, to a world that says, can I find life? Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one else is. No one else is coming. No one else preparing a place for you. No one else is dying for you. And so he's saying, trust me. And in me you'll find that I am the way and the truth and life. Let me pray. Father, we thank you that uh, Jesus did actually come for us. That he took a path that we couldn't take. Lived the perfect life and gave it up freely for us so that we could enjoy the results, the benefit of that. And so therefore he prepares a place for us that we're not entitled to, that we couldn't earn, that we don't deserve, but he did that for us, Lord. And we thank you. We thank you for what Jesus has done. Father, my prayer would be for everyone here and those that we encounter during the week that they have opportunity to understand that when Jesus says this, when Jesus makes himself known, He just wants us to know. He wants our friends to know, our family to know, our school friends, our colleagues, our neighbours to know that he did indeed come for them, that he did indeed come for every one of us, that he wants us to know him, to follow him, to find life in him that we can't find in anything else. And to understand that we that in his sight we are valuable and precious. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.